All right. So the lecture for today is focused on humanism. And so far, uh, I consider Aristotle's virtues, I call it ancient humanism or spiritual humanism. And I think that every major religion, I teach a world philosophies class, and I teach that um, Socrates, Jesus, Confucius, Buddha, um, Muhammad, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you just go through Aristotle's list of virtues, and then you talk about how each of those sort of moral icons, those iconic figures, basically exhibited those virtues. They had those character traits. And also a lot of the stories that people remember the best, um, the stories that get passed on. So the Bible has a lot of stories and the Quran has a lot of stories. But oftentimes the stories people really, really remember about Muhammad or really remember about Jesus or Buddha follow one of these virtues because the virtues are so basic. And so that's, that's kind of what I wanna get at, just finding the common ground because in the news, we always easily can find the differences and we can easily find how politics and economics divide people, but in the name of religion. So religion gets caught up with politics and economics. Um, so my job, I think, as a teacher is to say that I'm looking for our common humanity based on pleasure, pain, and fear. We're a certain kind of evolved creature. Um, and then our common pursuit of these virtues, and we have conversations about those virtues. We disagree on um, the specifics, but we don't disagree that self-control is important. We might just disagree on how much self-control, uh, what's too much, what's too little, but we usually don't agree that nobody needs to have any self-control, for example. So, so um, I've tried to, you know, I've tried to emphasize that. And then a healthy psyche, again, Aristotle's um, model, but we've also seen how um, the Catholic Church, Christianity, the Pope has his model, Kant has a model, the utilitarians have a model, Augustine has a model. So there's different ones. And the people that were that became humanists had read all of these other options. And they came up with this as their model for what we should aim for in life, for the good life, right? The healthy psyche it can't ever be separated from a way of life, right? The healthy psyche is the motivator behind your life, what you choose, why you choose it. So, um, so that's what we're getting at, just looking at similarities and differences between ancient humanism and modern humanism. And then again, the relationship between the values you learn in, at, at home, perhaps in the name of religion, or the values you learn at school, K through 12, and then the values you learn at AUW. Because AUW, the common values we have are some kind of humanism because the professors, the staff, and the students are treated equally apart from their religion, their ethnicity, their nationality, right? So there has to be some common ground. So I think humanism is the common ground. And I would imagine that if you interviewed any of your teachers or staff, they would either call themselves some kind of humanist or they would call themselves a Muslim humanist, right? Um, 
because if they weren't a Muslim humanist, they I don't think they would teach at AUW, right? Because they they would prefer just Muslims for some reason. So that's what we're getting at is that I do think this has a lot to do with AUW, its mission statement, its desire to, to link people together at this level of our common humanity. Um, so I'm gonna start out just in case some student wanted to react to something in this before I start going over it. Um, so let me start with that. Did anybody have a question or a comment before I start talking? No, probably so. Okay. Did you say yes? Okay. She said no, Professor. Oh, she said no. Okay. All right. So point number one, and I want you to take notes on this again, because it can be your post. You can get your homework done. But I'm, then I'm going to ask you about it too. The importance of philosophy, right? Do you agree with this? Philosophy is the expression of the human need to find significance and meaning. And in this one, your religious tradition is a subclass of philosophy. So all of the world's religions are branches of philosophies. The reason why philosophy is a bigger branch is that religions start out with there's a God or there are gods or there are some kind of spiritual beings. Whereas philosophy, which is why I like it, like, if you want to be a raving atheist, fine. Just tell me what you think is worth living for. What are your values, right? What guides you in your life? Um, so philosophy is, to me, the biggest tent. It doesn't judge anyone starting out. It's just that you have to give an argument, right? So it's the expression of the need to find meaning. Uh, and to integrate your life around a compelling view of human existence, right? And um, we have more recently spoken about how D Frederick Douglass's, you know, goal was to get educated and to um, be able to think his way out of slavery, right? And Sojourner Truth had her view of God. And then um, the dancing in the mosque was education was the way out. Um, and it doesn't say in the reading that I gave you on dancing in the mosque, she doesn't necessarily reject Islam, right? But then the other one in Nomad, she did become an atheist, but I'm not advocating that. I just think everything she says are things probably everybody needs to know. And her conclusions, right? That Islam is inherently uh, authoritarian. I like, I don't agree with it, but I understand it. And I do think it's a good thing to read and think about. Um, anyway, so that's why philosophy is important. Everyone adheres to a philosophy. It includes everything and they combine theory and practice science and speculation about the cosmos, okay? So that's point number one. And I'll have you talking about that in a second. Then humanism defined, how is it defined? Well, it says it's a naturalistic view of reality. It rejects supernatural forces. Um, that nature is constantly changing, but there isn't a supernatural being that comes in there and changes the laws of nature at will, right? It changes um, in relation to what is there. So you can actually understand it through science. You can understand that nature is a changing system. And then you can understand the patterns in the system. Um, human beings are a product of evolution. Humans can solve their own problems through science and reason. 
and it opposes all theories of determinism, which means um, I can't control my fate, right? It's already determined by my genetics or my environment. Fatalism, there's nothing I can do. These are all types of passivity, right? Um, and it advocates freedom, creativity, um, setting up, you know, deciding what you want and going for it, right? So in the, in the thing about unjust suffering, when I went through that whole list, one of the main themes was from going from passive to active. What can't you control and what can you control? And so, um, so, Humanism is always ultimately active and creative. So you can know through science what you can't control, but that's not determinism. There's always something you can control, some creative way of moving beyond the things that are around you that you can't control. Um, okay, ethics, focus on self-development and the development of the community. Focus on the arts, appreciation of the arts. Focus on extensive social programs. So this would this should start sounding like John Stuart Mill, right? The higher pleasures, intellectual, artistic, and empathy. Social programs is helping out other people. Focus on democracy, um, trying to get as many people engaged in political life. Again, that was very Aristotelian too. Um, continually questioning yourselves, becoming the, uh, theoretical, critical thinkers, avoiding some kind of dogma that here's the set of words that has all the answers. And there's different kinds of humanism, scientific, secular, naturalistic, democratic. There's also spiritual humanism, which you'll see in the Manifesto of 1933. Um, it rejects escape to some, you know, make believe afterlife. It rejects being motivated by fear of hell or promise of pleasure in heaven, right? That shouldn't be your motive. If you're a humanist, that should not be your motive for how you live. Um, and it rejects self-interest as the motive, rejects the rationalization of egoism, right? So when we were talking about, um, actually, we, so Bentham, you know, talks about, I can do whatever I want, as long as I don't hurt somebody else. Um, that's not humanism. John Stuart Mill is much more of a humanistic, in this, um, and then they're critical of the USA because we're too materialistic, or and they're critical of them because because of fundamentalist religion. We have a lot of uh, people in the USA who whose religious belief is not connected to science at all. So my big thing in my in my teaching is that there have been hundreds of views of how to unite reason with religion, or science and religion, reason and faith. And so I try to present some of those to my students. Um, the origin of humanism in the USA, um, Thomas Jefferson was a big humanist, the Declaration of Independence, Abraham Lincoln. So it's, it's pretty sad actually, when you look at COVID and you look at how many Americans reject science and they won't take the vaccine and they claim to be patriotic and they claim to be referring to the founders all the time. And it's exactly the opposite of the founders. So you can think about that in your countries. If your countries were based on democracy and actually most people accept authoritarianism or the leaders talk about patriotism and the founders, but they are not democratic at all. So I don't think it just happens in the US, but I do think it's sad to see what's happening to my country. Um, 
So this started, right, uh, the Renaissance was before the Enlightenment in the West. And um, there was Catholic humanism. We studied that with the Pope. Um, let's see. Those are, these are just things mostly about the U.S., but it is interesting to know the U.S. accepted people with many, many different philosophies. And, and at the time, that was very progressive. But now, lots of countries are multilingual, multicultural, multi-faith, you know, interfaith. So it's not just the U.S. It probably never was. It's just that the U.S. was pretty full of itself about that. You know, for a long time, we were supposedly the beacon of democracy, but I, you know, we're not that anymore. So things change. Um, let's see, they, they don't accept uh, Marxism, communism, socialism, because it's based on determinism. You are determined by your economic system and your place in that system. But they, um, they like the part where they're trying to promote everybody's well-being. Okay, let's see. So naturalism is not um, just impulsivity. You know, all I care about is eating, drinking, and sex and materialism. That's, what natu that's not what naturalism is. All right. So um, let me just start out. Let me just stop here for a minute and give students a chance to react. Whoever wants to, this is optional, but I wanna make sure I don't just talk the whole time. So why don't you just, you could say, say you don't want to respond right now, that's fine. But I just wanna just stop listening to myself talk for a minute. So Aurora, do you have any sort of reaction to what what I've presented you with so far? Uh, no, Professor. Amal? Um, I'm thinking, Professor. Okay, that's okay. Fardine? Not right now, Professor. Okay, Masoma? Uh, yes, Professor. Professor, I really liked uh, the points that mentioned at the beginning of this outline about the importance of philosophy, and I found it convincing. And yeah, I I think I'm agree with the points that's mentioned here. So, okay, so yeah. so those of you who are working on a post, you could say, yeah, I agreed with Masoma about philosophy or something like that, right? Um, I'm just giving you this cheat sheet. I'm giving you all this time to finish your post right during class. Um, why don't I do it this way? If anybody has something to say, why don't you raise your hand? That would be easier. Um, okay, new chat, go ahead. I wanted to say that in humanism, I really like the, like the idea that they don't believe in determinism or fatalism because um, personally, I go through a tough time if I think that everything is determined already, then it really makes no sense to put any effort or use our brain or think to think critically. So I like that idea. I have liked that idea so far. And also, it's humanism. It's it kind of it uh, unites re uh, reason with science. So it's very much authentic and. I think anyone, no matter from uh, which religion or which background we are, we can follow humanism. And as you were saying, someone can be a religious humanist, no matter from which religion he or she belongs from. And also, um, you were saying um, uh, that commun they don't follow or believe in uh, they don't support communism because that is deterministic but at the same time they like the idea that they are um, they want people's welfare and that is why they want uh, communism so yeah I like this thing so far very good anybody else want to make a comment okay <laughs> I am going to call on each of you eventually so get ready um, so, you know, if 
you should pick the thing you really want to talk about too, because I'm going to catch you eventually. Um, all right. Oh, Diana, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor. So I just um, uh, went through the definition of humanism, and I do agree with the point B, C, uh, D, and um, F, G, H, and I, but I was confused a bit about the point um, I, L, uh, and I'm not really sure that that suits in my community or personally in my, what I talk about humanism. So I'm not really sure about this one. And- um, This uh, one that says we reject theism, deism, modernism, is that right? Mm, the L one after the professor reject oh. is kept to a com compensatory realism, realism of make belief or supernatural uh, solids. So I'm not oh. sure about that, yeah. Oh, up here, let's see. And Oops. also, okay. And also about the reject view that human beings are moved only by self-interest. So might might be, I'm not sure about this one. And that's what I thought. Okay. Do you remember when um, Bentham, right? Bentham says it's all pleasure and pain. Yes. Right. Or there are other people that even are more cynical than that, right? It's all just me, myself, and I, and I want more money or I want more power or something like that. So obviously humanists would reject what you would, what, wickedness, basically, <laughs> right? People who have the wrong goals. Yeah. Um, but even among people who claim to have some kind of idea of the good, they're going to disagree, but but on the other hand, they do have quite a bit of room, like Nuchad pointed out. You know, they just have certain guardrails, and then within that, there's a lot of acceptance and toleration and different kinds of humanism. But there's certain things, right? Determinism is not humanism, and then fundamentalism or religious fanaticism. There's definitely things that are outside of the bounds. Um, so that's kind of what we're getting at. Does that make sense, Diana? Yes, Professor. And one thing I want to comment on that, that is uh, in here, they, they mentioned about the democracy and uh, pro, uh, parliamentary government. But I think uh, when I realized this, so I don't think, we don't have the practice of this in Afghanistan. Yeah. But they are telling about the democracy, the parliamentary government rule and this all that. Um, they are giving this opportunity to have uh, freedom of speech, freedom of blah, blah. But still they don't actually, we don't have those things. So sometimes we feel like we, we have symbolic government or symbolic president, but Actually, we are might be they are not practicing in real. Only we have by the name of these things in our government. I feel like that, but I well, don't Diana, see. it's interesting because nobody in the U.S. would ever think that the political leaders of Afghanistan ever tell the citizens that they're democratic, right? Because all we hear about is the authoritarianism, right? But I do think that they, everyone needs to know that if you're a citizen in most countries, the leaders are telling you that they're democratic, right? Does that make sense? Because when you read the news about other countries, all you read about is what's actually going on. It's not that often that you read about what the politicians are telling people and what people might actually be believing. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, yeah. okay. Choosing. Okay, Diana, that's good. Because um, when George Bush, after 9-11, there was a lot, the Republican Party was starting to unite reason and faith. And George Bush was talking about his faith all the time. And I would go to Greece 
And all they knew about was the invasion of Iraq, the, bill, the billions of dollars corporations are making on the war and the torture, you know. And I told them, well, actually Bush talks about religion and they go, really? <laughs> and they had no idea that actually Americans, some of them vote for Bush because he's so religious. <laughs> right. Okay. So Diana, I, I hope you understand that that even happens in the U S but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but to all of you, I just say, that's why AUW is such a great place to go to school because you do get the inside story from people from all these countries that it would be so hard to get the inside story. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and so I appreciate that, Diana, a lot. And so if any of the rest of you, you know, want to talk about um, whether your rulers say that they're democratic and they follow the rule of law and maybe they say they're humanistic and they're tolerant and they're really not at all. So I hope maybe you understand that this language, on the one hand, it's a good set of values. On the other hand, because it's good, if people actually did it, politicians will really use it and abuse it to make themselves look good. Does that make sense to the rest of you? I, you know, I hope you can think of examples maybe where your politicians do that. Um, does anybody else want to raise their hand at all? Okay, because each each point, you know, has a whole lot there to unpack. So um, let me go to the 1933, because I want you to see how America has changed. And then I want you to think about your own countries and what's going on in your countries. So. Oh, that's 73. Let's go back to 33 here. Okay. Religion can be dogmatic and anti-scientific, but it should not be, right? All of you must have an opinion about that because you all know the difference. We need a new statement of religious of religion and religious humanism. So in 1933, religion was was powerful among intellectuals. And so they want religious humanism. So again, I want you to think about in your final statement about a healthy psyche, do you want to write the healthiest is a kind of religious humanism? Um, they regard the universe as self-existing, not created. They're part of nature. It rejects dualism. Remember that St. Augustine had that split between the eternal and the temporal. So definitely religious humanism is not gonna have that kind of a split. If you like that better, that's fine, you know, and I have students who like it, that's great. Uh, excuse me, religious culture is also the product of human evolution spiritual evolution, intellectual evolution, and social, uh, cultural evolution. Um, so we're going to reject supernatural guarantees of values, right? If I'm good, I'll go to heaven. And if I'm bad, they're, they're not going to want that because, um, well, that shouldn't be anybody's, that's not a humanistic way of life. The other humanists would say, this is what I want to do to help others flourish and for me to flourish and to leave behind a better world for my children and to leave a legacy of somebody who tried to humanize people, to promote humanistic values. And if, you know, if there's some God who's going to send me to hell for that, I guess I better go there. All my friends will be there. But on every major religion, that's where you'd end up going to heaven. It's just that that's not my motive. It's not what I care about. I'm just not worried. It's just to me, it doesn't matter at all. But it does seem odd to me that certain people in the name of religion will do things that really should get you sent to hell. 
but they do it in the name of God and they think it's going to get them to heaven. And that's why I don't want to talk about that because all I want to do is what I know is humanistic. And I have no ulterior selfish motive. Um, so, okay. That would be the values are determined through intelligent inquiry. Um, religion has to limit, has to formulate its hopes in the light of science and scientific methods. So if you figure out um, through social science, you can figure out things like what is the best size number of children in a kindergarten classroom for them to get the best teaching, right? What's if there are 18 in the classroom as opposed to 24 in the classroom, right? Just that kind of social science data. And then you decide, okay, we're gonna have 16 because that's the optimum. That's the kind of thing where you, you wanna promote human well-being, so you're, which is what your religion should tell you you want. And then you do everything in light of science and social science and data collecting, right? Um, as opposed to sort of praying for the best. <laughs> and then if you want to be a good teacher, and uh, you just do the social science, you find out what's the best way to teach kids based on their, you know, their the development of their brains, right? And that that is that would be consistent with religious humanism because you're living for the sake of love God, love your neighbor as yourself, helping other people out. Uh, but that would, and other people would say, well, it's just humanism. I don't want the religion part. And someone else would say, no, I want the religion part. This is what God wants me to do. And God wants me to do the science and the social science and get the skills and the education. Um, nothing is alien, nothing human is alien. So that, that, that just means that eating, drinking, and sex are fine. They're sacred. Um, there's nothing that's, that's outside of the realm of the religious. And the Greeks are like that, right? Um, the goal is complete realization of, so that would be Aristotelian flourishing. Um, and you replace old attitudes. This would be um, in the Middle Ages in uh, the West. But again, you can think about it yourself. Are there certain religious rituals that really pull you away from humanism and prevent you from developing yourself and from helping other people um, in the best way possible? Are there religious practices that, you know, assume that teachers don't need to study social science and they don't need to get the skills and they don't need to sort of order their lesson plans according to what the data has provided or any job, right? That if you really want to do it in a way that's consistent with, you should have an idea of God where every time you get a chance to do your job better based on science and social science, that's what your religion would also want you to do. So, um, so you, don't, you don't split those apart. There's nothing uniquely religious and supernatural as opposed to humanistic and natural. Um, when crises come, we face it with knowledge. Um, Let's see, fostering creativity. All the institutions should exist to develop life. And it is, um, it's critical of greed and the desire for wealth. Um, okay. Okay, so, all right. That was number, that was 1933. The focus was a new statement of religion and religious humanism. What happened in 1973? So again, I want you to use analogies with your own countries. Technology, right? 
This is when technology was coming in. I was in college in 1973, so it wasn't that long ago. And so when we look at the 2000 one, and then actually you guys can go online, there's more recent ones too. And the people who sign these things have a lot at stake. They think about this stuff. So when you read it, it's, it's been thought about by a lot of people who identify as humanists. So 1973, technology is coming in. Um, and we're starting to understand ecological damage, all right? Overpopulation, uh, crowding, there's getting to be totalitarian, nuclear weapons, biological weapons. So here's the next set of problems. Some people are thinking it's the end times, you know, that God is going to come and then they run away from reason and they don't try to solve the problems. This happened in the 60s in the US. They had, people had cults, a lot of cults. Um, but the humanists will say we need to use more science, right? And fuse reason with compassion. So if you remember, John Stuart Mill thought we can base a whole society on empathy. So these people are more secular, right? Um, they don't reject religion, right? But they see we need to fuse reason with compassion, okay? Religion can inspire dedication to the highest ideals, but traditional and authoritarian religion rejects science, right? So we are not, we don't associate with that kind of religion. And so in the first one, they start out with, we need a new view of religious humanism. In this view, it's saying, we're gonna assume reason and compassion, but we won't reject all religion. Some religion is okay, but that's different, right? All of a sudden, the secular sort of is the fallback, and but some religion's okay. It just has to be a new view of religion. Um, uh, one that emphasizes independence of mind, and they reject dependence, obedience, fear, and again, I hope you can see analogies with your own situation, because these are just old patterns. Uh, promises of salvation, fear of da damnation, they reject that. Some types of political doctrines they object to, either capitalist or communist, because people blindly believe in capitalism to save the world or communism to save the world. Humanists reject that. Um, ethics is uh, situational. It's based on choices. Um, you want to pursue your own life's enrichment um, in spite of all these negative influences. The best tools are reason and intelligence. Um, Faith can't substitute for reason. Reason has to be tempered by humility and a critical intelligence, right? Critical thinking. Um, but we also have to always value the preciousness and dignity of the individual person. So that brings in Kant. That brings in, um, a, again, traditional religious values. Um, sexuality, that they're against intolerance, repression, sex is not dirty, it's not evil, and they also favor birth control, access to abortion and divorce, right, um, based on people's choices, because, um, because sexuality is so powerful, people can either flourish or really be harmed um, in their sexual life. Um, the law should allow consenting adults to make their own choices, okay? And children should be educated, have sex ed, and also be taught what it is to be a sexually mature person, which is important, right? Don't manipulate the other person. Don't um, intimidate, no violence. Every time you have sex, it could, should be consensual. 
You should tie sex to a long-term commitment. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can teach kids about morals and um, sexuality without thinking it's dirty or without thinking you can do whatever you want, right? Civil liberties are really, really important to the humanists. Um, people ought to be able to choose uh, when they die. It shouldn't be illegal. So again, that's, that, that's a basic humanist position, freedom of uh, expression, association, open society, participatory, citizens should be able to, to participate. Um, education is important. Um, separation of church and state is really important to a humanist because as soon as you unite the power of the church, religion with the power of politics, you corrupt politics because they hide behind religion and you corrupt religion because they get more concerned with power than with actual human well-being and they won't speak up against the government. Um, Moral equality, so eliminating discrimination is a very humanistic position. Um, and again, some religions, yes, other religions, no. Uh, religious traditions change, they're influenced by the culture. Education, they're against racism. Um, they're against nationalism. They appreciate pluralism and diversity and they abhor violence, right, and force. Cooperation's good. Um, work together on economic growth that'll promote a middle class. Technology, let's see, transportation. Um, and also always with compassion, a globalization and development. So another, another emphasis, a big emphasis in 1973 was technology, uh, globalization and science and promoting a middle class. Those were the, the biggies in 1973. Um, so let me stop there for a minute. And I am gonna ask each of you to have some reaction to something in the 1933, the 1973. And if you can, some, something you noticed about the differences, something you can make an analogy with your own country, um, something you personally happen to care about, something we've read already, or something you can link to what we've done already, or something that you think is really important for a healthy psyche. Okay. Aurora, do you have, what what would you like to say? Uh, Professor, I may agree with you. Otherwise, I have nothing to say. Okay. Um, Amal? Okay. So um, I'd like to reflect on one, one part of the sexuality part in 1973, like uh, there is mentioned the divorce. So until recently, uh, women in Syria has the right to take the divorce decision. So they won't be divorced. Before that, they, like, they couldn't be uh, divorced uh, without their uh, partner's uh, permission. Yeah, and I guess that's um, it's it, like it's too late, but like it's a good step towards the women's um, like humanism and the women's right. Uh, yeah. What year? What year did they get that? Last year. Last year. Okay. Yeah. Two oh one. Two oh two oh. Okay. Um. All right. Yeah. I mean. Another thing that's important to remember is that you can have all these, all these things, and yet a person's life is often completely sidetracked or crippled by something really immediate, right? Like you married the wrong person. And so yeah, you, can't, 
You can't get the education. You can't participate in this global culture. You can't do anything. Yeah, you're even really like bad. when I look at the women's right, I'm so concerned about the laws regarding women in Syria because like even like they cannot give citizenship to their children. So uh, yeah, there are many things that needs to be fixed to call yeah. it, you know, yeah. Yeah, so that, that is a big issue. And so women get accused of like focusing on relatively immediate trivial issues compared to nuclear war and all this stuff, but this is where their lives get stuck, right? And they, they have the capacity to do all this other stuff, but an unplanned pregnancy or marrying the wrong person or their father dies and all of a sudden their mother needs to find a guy for them to marry so that because they're poor i mean just stuff like that completely throws a woman off is that is that make sense to you amal yeah it does. yeah okay and so that's why women have to fight for these basic things that men just take for granted uh yeah okay fardeen what would you like to say Anything? Okay. Um, Hello, can you yeah, hear me? Yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, sorry, Professor, something was wrong with my mic. Um, oh, one of the things that stood out to me was um, the part about apocalyptic prophecies uh, from the 1973 manifesto. So um, during the pandemic, I noticed that a lot, like people saying the world is ending uh, because of the direness of the situation when it first began. Yeah, I heard it a lot around me. And because, um, you know, if you are if you can convince someone that there's no tomorrow, they're going to have a strong reaction to it. I found that being used a lot. And even before that, but then uh, most recently then, I, I've uh, witnessed that being um, used as a tool to control people with fear and then, yeah, make them conform to certain things, uh, religious traditions, even if they might, um, in other circumstances, even if they might think that that is not um, the most reasonable thing to do, but then if you control someone with fear, they're more susceptible to <laughs> manipulation like that. Yeah. Did people say things like, the reason God allowed COVID is because we're becoming too secular or there's too much divorce or women are getting too uppity or something like that? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that, among other things. <laughs> Did they also say you have to come back to the mosque or you should convert to Islam? Um, for, uh, I don't remember uh, the convert Islam to Islam part because they didn't say that to me. But yeah, definitely the come back to mosque thing. So. <laughs> OK, well, I mean, if it's any consolation, it happened in the US, too. Um, so I hope you understand that AUW is designed for students to be able to have the kinds of conversations that we're having right now. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, Professor. So that we develop this whole culture of critical thinking and we can understand that no matter what country we're in, there's the same kind of ways of either developing a democracy of critically thinking citizens or destroying it through religion and politics and fear and fantasies and all that stuff. And so humanism, that's, that's the eye of the soul, right? That's the psychological um, uh, light that humanism wants to shed light on and just get other people whatever other name you can call it, here's our common ground. Does that make sense, Fardine? Yes. yes, Professor, it does. Okay. Um, so, Falak, do you have something to say? Um, yeah, Professor. Um, so I wanna talk about the Human Manifesto second. So in addition to the absolute rejection of thesism, various political stances are also supported like uh, the opposition, uh, opposition to racism, support of human rights and the right to and right to unrestricted abortion and contraception. 
Yeah, I like this part. That's it. Okay. So again, I have pointed this out, but um, the way abortion gets used as a tool to keep women down um, because you don't want to kill innocent life. Well, the trouble is politicians who say that get caught having affairs, telling their mistress to get an abortion. Um, I think people really need to be careful about the way that that gets used as a tool by politicians to whitewash what they're really doing with their power. Um, really, the most wicked politicians who shrink the middle class, who do every nasty thing you can imagine, they come out there, oh, abortion, you know, and they're just using it as a tool. So I definitely, you know, I, I don't, I'm not planning to get pregnant so I can get an abortion. It's not like I really believe in this. It's just that it shouldn't be a political tool. It should be something that if you don't believe in it, don't do it, right? <laughs> um, if you think you're going to hell, don't do it. But don't make it a political thing. It's like it's like uniting religion and politics. If you unite abortion to politics, you're going to get more abortions and terrible politics. So I, I do want to keep reminding students of that because that is such a touchstone to divide women with each other. Does that make sense, guys? It really is this huge divider. Um, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, and it prevents so much progressive stuff from happening. Because it's, you know, you can't get over this one thing. Um, okay, now, do you have something? Yes, Professor Aswami, I see the difference of religions, like you mentioned uh, at the previous time. There was, uh, like, in 1983, uh, and no, I mean, uh, the way we believe before and now there is totally different. Uh, I am not the one from 1993, but I want to mention the difference is like, now I have seen the influence, uh, the religion was influenced by the culture because like when I was young, I see the difference is like, if we celebrate the Christmas, there was just, we are like, very unity and then come to the church together and pray and worship together. But now it's people more focusing on the uh, big celebrations at uh, a party or something like that. So it's the different wind between these two, I think. Okay. Um, all right, so do you think um, if your country or if your people, if the friends you know, become more humanistic, do you associate that with morally degenerated, morally corrupt? Uh -huh, professor, I, but I think it's, it is fine because like we are more free. Okay. So to be free. that's yeah. what I want you to think about, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to it's want good to, be that, free, to, to want to be free yeah. does not mean to want to go have sex with whoever you want. It doesn't yeah, mean sure, to sure. be generous. <laughs> right? yeah, like yeah, we okay. were not controlled by the religions uh, and also people. So like we are out of the control. Yeah, it is good for me. Okay. And not only that, but it means you're taking more responsibility than ever, right? And you're being creative. And yeah, you're yeah, really sure. trying to create, freely create the best life you can imagine, which yeah. is going to be way more moral than if you just go along with whatever. Yeah, um, sure. Okay, good. Uh, Ritika, what have you got? Uh, professor, I didn't, I don't have anything. Okay. I'll just, you know, I will call on you off and on, but you, you know, you, you do what you do. Jana Tool, have you got something? Okay, Supti, do you have something? Um, 
manifesto uh, in the 1973 uh, i am agree with the civil uh, liberties and the moral equality because in today's life uh, um actually today's could you supti could you slow down a bit it's not super clear I think my microphone is disturbing. What? Okay. I'll come I'll come back to you, Supti, okay? The main thing is there's a little bit of uh I don't know noise, and so you just have to talk slower, I think. Um, Isabel, do you have a reaction? Nope. Uh, new chat? Yes, Professor. So, firstly, I want to talk about the democracy, the government of Bangladesh. So, as someone is saying before, uh, how government or uh, people use uh, things as a political tool to exploit people so in our country also our government keeps saying that we are democratic we do fair elections but in reality we uh, I, I when the last time we had election I became 18 but I, even after that I couldn't have the experience to give vote because you know we all were like we already know that we our vote won't be taken and also when people were going for giving vote the roads were blocked or some or other things were done so that people can't cast their vote so, so but internationally they maintain an image that Bangladesh or uh, our country is very de democratic all people are living in harmony and peace and all of that stuff so yeah this is one thing and also in our country most people we have to stay uh, uh, most people be, are people who do not believe in women's rights who thinks that whatever however things are now going are fine this is how things should be men are superior women are inferior so also government use this as tool like i had one course on law and during that time our professor was saying that in bangladesh uh, there is a law that the father's property um, when it will be divided women uh, or daughters will get half of what the sons will be getting so pro um, professor was saying that they were working on it and they sh he proposed this um, uh, to make it equal but then they were saying that see we, we know our country we know people of our country so they won't be agreeing to it so so that pe they can keep government can keep people in their control they some they go with the people majority and also democracy has one issue that is in democracy we do elections so government ha constantly have to uh, keep people um, in their control they have to stay as people's favorite so nurturing the all the biases that people have instead of changing those so that's one thing and oh another thing is um, I want to talk uh, about how people see philosophy in Bangladesh most people think uh, they don't know anything about philosophy they just think that in philosophy we study things that are against religion yeah if you study religion uh, if you study philosophy you are going to be an atheist you are not going to follow your religion you are completely going to be devastated destroyed <laughs> so yeah mm. and oh okay another thing about um, the part uh, where uh, it was mentioned about sexuality and how um, it's uh, nothing uh, it shouldn't be concerned about without, about anyone but those two people and it should be con uh, in consent so about i kind of found a similarity of harm principle i don't know if i am right but um i personally support the principle of harm principle because i think that is very convenient um, in making people understand that whatever decision you take for your life if it's not harming anyone it's fine because there are many people who make mistakes or there are many people who are ashamed of their sexuality and the, it, uh, the principle of harm principle can be used as a very uh, convenient tool to make that 
make those people understand that it's okay and it's it's none of anyone's business it's up to you and if you are not harming anybody you are an adult and it's totally up to you it's not it's not an issue so and i have seen i i watch youtube and um, actually i follow a channel where people send many um, emails to th- uh, that person and that person selects many uh, two emails and then she talks about those uh, and that's her, those are like counseling videos so i have seen that women giving advices of, of harm principle a lot in those like if you are not harming anybody that's none of anyone's business it's up to you yeah okay yeah. that's kind of like bentham right yeah. yeah yeah uh i wanna say one thing like nozat said that in our country uh usually uh the girls couldn't get the property equally boys from their uh father like uh, a girl get the half of yeah. what what boys get so i hear uh one reason like uh, that is uh, usually girls also get property from their husbands that's why they didn't get uh, equal like their brother from father's house i heard that i heard that yeah that's uh, but also yeah. you know a husbands also get from their uh, wife so yeah. it's actually just an excuse i would say well you know the other thing and aurora aurora I mean you might know this but that's in the Quran, right? So it's yes. in, yeah, okay. But the thing is when I teach the Quran, I teach that that was incredibly progressive compared to what was going on. Because in the culture women were just property, they never inherited anything. And so the way I teach it is that Muhammad was way ahead of his time, right? Does that make sense? Yes, professor. But, but you can still change that now right yeah. yeah and i i do say that with the four wives there were a lot of circumstances where women you know men were getting killed women absolutely had to be married to survive there were reasons and then mohammed brought in that that each woman had to have her separate living space and she had to be treated decently and so again it was way ahead of its time <laughs> but i think you could say the time is up you know we we don't have the circumstances and it really should just be one at this point so you can recognize that muhammad was ahead of his time and he respected women way more than other men and still say we can move beyond that because muhammad had moved beyond the traditions of his time so why can't we continue in the same spirit of giving women, you know, the lives that they deserve. Does that make sense to you, Aurora? Yes, professor. And yeah, Nusa say that in our country they didn't uh, count philosopher. Yeah, exactly. When <laughs> they hear someone is philosopher or philosophical thinking, they did uh, ironic types comment on that. Especially if it's a woman. Oh my god, right? <laughs> yeah, professor. <laughs> murder at the stake yes i know women were condemned as witches and you name it um and yeah, when i'm in rural arkansas i think about gee if it were 100 years ago i probably would get called a witch you know <laughs> i live alone and i think these thoughts and oh my god it's terrible uh, <laughs> i mean it's funny because it's not that funny it wasn't that long ago uh but anyway aurora yeah you got it you caught on um so can you hear me yeah supti go ahead yeah uh, i am also agree with nujat uh, because when the covid is starting in our country many people think that they are not religious because covid is coming because of the people are not right religious that's why the covid attack those people the those, those who are not religious and the property in my religion also same thing uh, the girls cannot uh, cannot uh, Uh, get the property from their fathers if the mothers have the property then the girls get the property uh, <laughs> this is many uh, discrimination i think yeah i mean it's bad enough within families for sibling rivalries and 
But you know, to this life, uh, to this thing, we are the equal. I think girls and boys is equal. So I think every people has a uh, every people has equal rights to get their uh, property. But in my regions, I don't know why they think the. Uh, in the past, uh, the girls cannot get any property from their father's side. Now it is rule: uh, if the mother has any property, then the girls can get this property. Yeah. Otherwise, not. Yeah, it really, it's crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> it really should at this time. It should be equality. Um, but uh, in my family, I have to tell you, it's a, it's another story. My parents, um, they were pretty frugal. So they had a certain amount to give and all their grandkids and all their kids got it totally equally divided. Well, I have way less money than my brother and sister. <laughs> and, and my sister's daughter is going to inherit millions of bucks, but she got the same amount from my parents. <laughs> As my kids that are, you know, but okay, fair is fair, you know, and it's all equal. Um, I just kind of wish people would make judgments, right? That would be the Aristotelian thing is, well, let's just make reasonable judgments and let's just help everybody to flourish. But you can't trust people to do that. So that's why you make these laws. And then the laws in, end up, you know, they have their own problems. And the problem is, Supti, the, the question to all of you is, if there weren't a law, don't you think it would probably be worse? I mean, the law is not fair, but it's, it's better, you know, it'd be better to have an equal law and enforce it. That would be the best, even though that still would end up with some pretty crazy stuff. But it's better than not having any law, because then people can do some pretty wicked stuff. Does that make sense to those of you who are talking about that, Supti or? Yeah, it's pretty clear. So, you know, what I want you to learn how to do is every time you get outraged by something, <laughs> there's lots of stuff. Think about like, what would the solution be, right? Mm -hmm. And just think creatively. And um, so, that, so that when eventually you do have a position where you do get to make some decisions, for decades, you've already been thinking creatively and you've been thinking outside of boxes and you've been constantly thinking about human flourishing as the goal. And so when you do get, you know, your role in the world, and you have to make some kind of decisions, you will have a really good habit of mind to because you've practiced. Does that make sense to you guys? It's not a pie in the sky. Like, how come we don't? It's just kind of what would be best if you, you know, what would the best judge do? And then someday, all of you are going to be that judge. You're all going to get some expertise. And eventually, I remember when I was teaching, I asked the registrar, well, who needs to make this judgment about this? I think the student should do this now. Who should I talk to? And she said, you, like you're the one. <laughs> and so I think all of you will be in that place someday. So um, try not to try not to end with the outrage. Try to start and think, you know, think forward, think creative. Um, okay, let's see who's next. Isabel? Yes. <laughs> I think he called me just now, but uh, my microphone is not, so I didn't I just fixed it. Okay, go ahead, Isabel. Uh, I would like to react to what Abraham Lincoln mentioned there, the goal, the goal of liberty and declaration of independence brought the promise to future people that all should have an equal chance. So this, this kind of uh, things does not always happen to democratic countries. Mm -hmm. Like for example, in my country, like we are a democratic country, but the people and the political peoples over there do not apply uh, 
the kind of equal rights, something like that. So especially I'm focusing on uh, nepotism stuff. So this is kind of like a biggest issue in, in, in the country. Like whoever it is applying for a job, you can't even get the job immediately just because you don't have someone you know in the company or organization or stuff like that. So people are usually focused on uh, people that they know, then they get more chances to to work or to get the job. So I think this is a very big issue that uh, we should look at it. And yeah, just because some most of the people are working, but they do not have the skills that the job uh, is really needed. So I think I'm really concerned with this kind of stuff, but I don't know how uh, we can, what can we do for like reducing this kind of stuff? And also, yeah. yeah. And you can imagine, you know, are you really not going to hire your kid or not going to ask your friend to hire your kid? I mean, that really takes a commitment to democracy if you have that choice and you turn it down. Um, but it really is harmful. I mean, the head of Tyson Foods, that's a huge multi-million, huge billion dollar, they passed yeah. it on to the, the heir, right? The kid that's, whose father had owned it. And he did, all he'd ever done with his life has been a cocaine addict, right? And yet he got to run the company and he ran it. He got caught in a 17 state illegal immigration scheme. He got, he's notorious for how he treats the workers. I mean, he's awful, right? And so, yeah, yeah nepotism it's is- The worst thing, like many of the students, I mean, many of the graduates, they graduate from the university, but they do not get the chance to actually work in the place where they have to be because they have skills and knowledge about it. But just because of this kind of issue, so they do not have the job that they want. Yeah. So again, that's an outrage. And then you have to, first of all, you have to have empathy. You know, you have to understand the pull, but then you have to figure out, okay, how am I going to, you know, creatively live my life so that if or when I do get a chance to interview for a job, somebody will want me, right? That's about all you can do. Um, and, and somebody is going to know that the young people who did have to work for it are going to be the ones you want to hire because they'll, they'll work for it, right? So I just want you to think about that in terms of marketing yourself for a job, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things would be that you don't let your grades go down during COVID, right? If they notice that. Exactly. exactly. Right, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. Once you get to college, you're starting to create a CV. And uh, that's why, again, I really want to help you, all of you. I can't, there, I don't think there's anything more I can do, uh, but I do want you to, to be able to say at a job interview, right? I'm one of those young people that really did the work and pulled herself up. And somebody's gonna take you. You just have to believe that. You have to believe the world isn't that corrupt. Um, and you might, I mean, it might take a while and there'll be disappointments, but at the end of the day, you have to live with yourself. And I don't know how a lot of people do go to bed at night and sleep because of how corrupt they are. But I think AUW students, I mean, the school picked you because they saw in that you, in you the potential to be that young woman right? The one that, that an employer would really want or a graduate student because of what you've shown that you've been able and willing to do. Does that make sense, Isabel? Yes, yes, professor. It As is. a way to take that outrage and then figure out how to get around it, right? Or how to creatively deal with it. Um, Fatima, do you have something?
Okay, she's uh, Pooja. Do you have something? Asia. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So I was uh, trying to connect uh, with the statement that one of our uh, classmates mentioned about uh, the right of like getting. Um, what was that? I forgot. Uh, parents property, something like that. I forgot. I'm so sorry. But like, when it comes to Nepal, is to uh, this term out of Indian, but there was this term getting a property from uh, dad's family side. Like, there wasn't a system when uh, we have we have to make a country uh, citizenship. So there was a system to have the citizenship only from the dad sides too. So later it got changed when like, for example, when uh, dad gets, uh, dad is no more or something. And then some move on a uh, mom's side and they used to get the citizenship like on that way. But there, there has been like a lot of protest going on, I mean, going on for this uh, circumstance, I mean, this problem, but mm -hmm. like, I really don't uh, understand why there is always like, a more priority from dad side rather than mom's side. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, Aisha, have you got something? Uh, okay, yes, Professor. Uh, so, I wanted to uh, focus on the Humanist Manifesto Part 2. Um, there is a point, uh, I mean, we need a new view of religion. Um, okay, so religion has become concerned with social action. I have something to tell like, um, okay. It was mostly the social action. Um, I won't say that traditional religious um, values, they are not affecting us, but uh, apart from it, there are some sort of, um, I mean, lack of securities for us in our country, for women. So which actually makes us so fearful about like uh, doing anything after, you know, after the evening. I mean, we cannot go outside alone. So something like this. And um, so it actually, sees our independence, I feel like this. And uh, also the, uh, from there, actually uh, the traditional religious point of views comes that uh, you should not go to uh, go outside after the uh, uh, evening. So yeah, it's I feel like these two are interconnected, the social action and traditional religion, yeah. Yeah, do you think, um... Do you think in the next 10 years or so, sometime in your lifetime, women will start having big demonstrations? Um, I mean, they even do in the US, it's called take back the night. And when there's you know, been violence in the US, women will demonstrate by going outside at night and just saying, we're not gonna let you know, ourselves be afraid. Do you think um, in your generation that there are going to be big movements for women to want to be outside at night? Uh, okay, so there is two extremes, I would say. One is like, one is uh, the, one part is actually going behind the bigotry, religious bigotry, and another part is just going to uh, the upper extreme. I mean, too much first. So no one is in the middle point. So uh, yeah, it will be the demonstration that um, some women will um, show their courage to, um, I mean, in my community as well, I mean, someone will work outside at night and then uh, come back before 8 p.m. sub per se, but um, not everyone can um, break this barrier. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I mean, I again, I do think it's interesting that women will get polarized. And I do think it's important for thoughtful women to try and be in the middle, right? Not be anti-religious and not be, on the other hand, um, anti-humanist, um, uh, right? And so, yeah, I just, 
Yeah, go ahead. I think uh, this kind of situation could be happen in the country, like free movement for women as well. But one thing is, uh, which is kind of a bit dangerous is that women are not safe to work at night. So it, it could be happen to free movement, but that could be dangerous as well. That is the thing that families are afraid of letting their daughters to go out at night. So yeah, this kind of stuff, it's a kind of difficult a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, professor. Yeah. I just want to say one thing. Like also our prime minister is a woman, but in our country, our women are not safe, even the female child also. They're not safe. Yeah. And, that, you know, the question is how to make them safe, right? Would be yeah. one way would be the whole family just goes outside at night. That's what they do in Europe. <laughs> right? They just hang out at night. And um, exactly. Right. It's great. You just have all these outdoor uh, cafes and everybody just sits and talks and plays music and has a fun. Um, okay, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I just it's so good to to have uh, free movement for everyone, even girls and boys. So like in my country, Timor Leste, we are free to move everywhere. But the problem is it's dangerous for especially for women. <laughs> so that yeah. is the thing that our parents do not allow the daughters to go out at night just because of that reason. Because right. they don't want something to happen to their right. daughters. That's it's just. You know, perhaps in some big cities and some sections of cities, you know, it's just people yeah. who say this is a safe place and we're just going to make it that. And then, you know, more and more of the best and brightest women will be attracted to places where they can actually live their life. Um, and then other people will have economic motives for maybe changing. Um, but but I think we can start, you know, at AUW creating a culture where women agree with each other on this and then they have to figure out, you know, how to, how to move forward in any way they can. I'm a night person, so I, I'm always out at night. Oh, um, wow. that's of stuff, you know, I just, yeah. But cities are much safer and more fun to be in at night, stuff's going on. Uh, anyway, so let's see. I think Diana and Fardine have their hands up, but I'm going to have to go to somebody I haven't even called on yet. Um, Mar let's see, Marjana, did I call on you? No, Professor. Um, yeah, um, just a minute. Uh, I wanted to point it out, point out uh, about one uh, point from Human Manifesto 1973. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's the moral equality, uh, the el elimination of um, discrimination based upon race, religion, sex, age, or, age or um, this uh, talent. So uh, for me, uh, AUW is the only place where I didn't, um, you know, face discrimination based on race my race uh, because you know i belong from a minority community in my country and uh, uh, you know I, I think this is this is one of the point uh, that should be looked upon in order to human in order to human uh, flourishment because um, uh, we still can see that um, if one if a woman is you know uh, uh, promoted in her workplace or anything, people will still think that uh, because she is a woman or she has the beauty, you know, they don't tend to um, acknowledge her talent. The, uh, what all they see is just their uh, beauty and... Uh, okay, good. You good. know, they uh, interpret so many things, bad things. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say, yeah. That's, that's what I wanted to point out. Yeah, I mean, that still happens in the US too. And some of it's legit. Like some of some, some men do hire women based on what they look like. They won't say that, you know, but- Yes, yes, Professor, that's what I- 
you can tell from the research that 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 affects it um yeah anyway uh yeah actually AUW I think also even picks out students from different races and from um minority races because not only do they want to help those women but they want to put them together like we're together right they want to create a culture where women are they can have whatever religion they want but they really understand humanism and they're really committed to some kind of humanism because women definitely need humanistic uh, friends, right? Uh, people with those kind of values without being demonized as degenerate or anti-religion or you know promiscuous or all sorts of stuff. So I hope by reading this, you can understand both how the stereotypes arise and also why they're wrong, right? When it comes to the real substance. Of what yes, professor. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's why I want to. I I like this uh, course and the conversation that uh, happens in the course. Uh, just to share one uh, incident of me uh, when I was in a class uh, standard twelve, uh, I had this viva for my uh, board exam, and you know this um, Rohingya issue in Bangladesh uh, that was happening at that time, and um, you know people in Bangladesh the. Uh, the uh, extremists are used to say that uh, we, the minority people came from uh, Myanmar and uh, they uh, proposed to send us to Myanmar and uh, take the Rohingya people in Bangladesh. And in, the, in that interview, uh, that interviewer asked me that uh, if you are a Buddhist, then why are the people in Myanmar are killing uh, uh, Muslim people like that. I mean, um, I was just 17 at that time. Um, you know, I didn't know wh uh, what to answer. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think that was pretty unfair to me. Yeah, when you, and, study, uh, that was, when, when you study logic, it's called guilt by association, right? It's not, just because you're associated with something doesn't mean you're guilty of. Yes, professor. And it doesn't doesn't make any sense to ask me that question. In that right. uh, that was a uh, interview that was a by Viva based on geography, so I don't know what made him uh, ask that. Right, really, it's holding you responsible for things you're not responsible for, and exactly. it's also an abuse of your power because as an interviewer you have power, you know. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So. What can you do? Well, you can actually vow that when you're in a position to do an interview, you will make sure never to treat anybody like that and not to abuse your position. Does that make yes. sense? Yeah, okay. Yes, Professor, absolutely. Yeah, that's, there's always lessons to learn, you know, that yeah. can really be, I will never do this, right? I will never make that mistake. Yes, Professor. Okay, Christina, do you have something? No, Professor. Okay. Diana, do you have your hand up? Yes, Professor. <laughs> For a long time. <laughs> it's all like Professor. So I have six comments. And the first one is about sexuality. Uh, because I have seen this issue for a long time in Afghanistan, especially the women. Uh, because they are not having this all right to have on birth control right to have abortion, right to have divorce, because I have seen very my beloved ones. One of my beloved ones was uh, wanting uh, to take her divorce and still the process is going on and still she couldn't take her divorce yet because her husband is, um, is taking drugs and she is having four kids and uh, lots of personal issue they have that's why she wanted to have the words. And the government didn't support her yet. And uh, the, because in here, uh, when a woman is asking for a divorce, so she is not having any right at all to have that. And we have one thing in Islam that when a woman is asking uh, for a divorce, then she will not, she will not be allowed to ask for Mehriya. Mehriya is the money 
uh, before the marriage they put uh, it is like an uh, uh, how I, I don't know how to say that but that is a kind of contract yeah. or deal okay. that when I if I ask for divorce then you need to um, you need to give this uh, amount of money but if a woman asks for a divorce then she is not allowed to ask for that money and um, on that case she did, she was not having the right she didn't ask for that still she's just asking for the divorce that she should be free from that pain and she should have a free life or a, a freedom of this all but still the government of afghanistan didn't allow because they said that we have religious rules and blah blah so that's why you're not allowed to get this and you need to uh, satisfy whatever you have in your life and a lots of things so yeah. Yeah. i have seen this all and even about the abortion or uh, family planning this all in here i don't see the practice of family planning uh, it is in those who are in age of 28 or 35 so those who are educated couple somehow they do practice but those who are above than 35 and they are uneducated, so mostly that is a kind of patriarchy, a couple that everything their husband will decide, even to have sex in a night, still that will be decided by a husband, not a wife. And mm -hmm. whatever husband said, so the wife needs to obey the husband because husband is husband and he is bringing money at home, he is working, he is on the main role in the family. So that is a big issue still in Afghanistan, especially in the provinces. And yeah. um, they are not having the right of abortion. So everything will be decided by male, not female. Yeah. And I talk about the civil liberties that, that we don't have freedom of speech. Uh, and mostly that's why today we are being killed and we are being the victim and to, because of a lots of issue in Afghanistan. So uh, that is going on still. And um, an open and democratic society, as well I talked before that in, they are not having these all things like in, to have uh, an open democracy in, in school, in family, in workplace. But one positive thing is that those who are educated uh, family and those who are uh, going to school right now. So they are trying to bring the democratic uh, rule in their family, or they are treating yeah. their child to, to, to behave like this, to behave and to consider democracy and right of freedom, right of speech and blah, blah, these all things. They are trying to have this. And right to universal education, unfortunately in the provinces of Afghanistan, the, in the majority parts, they, they don't allow girls to go to school because they say that, oh, you can see that today is 21st century and every country is trying to have a woman empowerment, which is not allowed in Islam. Actually, Islam has given the full right to the woman to have, to have access to education, but they have created a new Islam based on their opinion and they are uh, telling that everybody needs to obey that. That is not Islam. They have created another Islam for themselves. What I feel. And that's where, yeah, that's why the, the woman who wrote the book Nomad, you know, she she's anti-Islam. And so, you know, based on her experience, but you can you can make an argument. Um, I'm gonna have to let you guys take a break. Um, and then afterwards, what I'm gonna do, the first question I'm gonna ask is if you did go find some other branch of humanism, that's what I asked you to do. And so those of you who did, I want you to report in and then we'll see how long that takes. And then we can go back to the 2000 manifesto if we have time, but- um, Officer, my last point is remaining. Okay. And the last point was that economic growth that both couple needs to work together. In Afghanistan, I have seen some educated couple that their women are uh, asking for equal right and these all things uh, because they are also working on behalf of their husband 
or their husband and both right. couple and both the person are working but the point is that the woman is not um, is not using uh, their own money to their home so they will save them for themselves that no it is my money and i have the rule or the right of your money but you don't have the right of my money so whatever she does with her money she claimed that it is my money and i have the right to wear to spend for that or some of them is giving to their mother's home member and i think when a woman is asking for equal right when she is telling everything should be equal then on that time they need to um, they need to work together for their wealth of their family that is the last point. okay so masoma actually needs to have her turn and then we'll then we'll break go ahead masoma <laughs> Professor, it's okay. Like if if it's been so long, I can you know uh, synthesize my point with also the the question about whether I have a new idea of humanism or not. So yeah, I can like you know talk about those after the break. You mean? Uh, yes. Okay, so we'll we'll bring up Masomo will get called on first, and then we'll go forward. Um, I just hope that you understand that what we're having is the kind of conversation you can only have in a democracy. This is the kind of free and open thinking that, you know, if you live in a country that is really authoritarian, you, you could be in trouble even if you had these conversations at home and some sibling or relative decides that they're gonna report you, you know? And so I just want you to, cherish it and know that it's natural and know that you cannot be healthy without it and then try to figure out you know what you can do to promote it or at least not to undermine it like you know there's a lot of people in europe who say you know free speech i'm going to go uh draw funny cartoons about muhammad and get those extremists really going but I, I think you should be careful, right? I think you should self-censor to some extent to try and promote, you know, humanistic values and humanistic bridges to preserve democracy. So I'm not one who thinks free speech means a freedom to say any dang thing you want, even if you know it's gonna aggravate somebody and then destabilize the society. And then people look for a strong man and then he blames women for everything. And then women have to put up and shut up, right? Does everybody understand that, that if you value it, make sure you're careful with it. <laughs> okay, so, okay, take a break. It's my thing has 48 minutes after. And so we'll come up uh, three minutes after the hour, okay. Three minutes, Professor? Three minutes after the hour, whatever hour you guys are. Oh, okay. okay. Right? Everybody has a different hour, so I just do the minutes. Okay. I'm sorry, you can pause the recording. Oh, thank you. Who said that? Okay, well, so actually, part of liberal arts education isn't just the content you know, that you learn critical thinking or you learn, you know, about stuff you wouldn't have learned about. It's also that you took a lot of classes that you didn't necessarily want to take and you were willing to put yourself through that um, and that you can see the benefit of it afterwards. But what an employer wants to know is, are you willing to do stuff to work hard at something that it doesn't, it's not obvious in the beginning that this is in your self-interest, right? And of course, an employer is gonna prefer employees that are willing to do that because most jobs include a lot of that, right? Maybe you could be functioning at this, you know, level three, but you get hired at level one, you gotta do stuff I know how to do that. I did that 10 years ago. The employer wants to know 
who's willing to do that and who's willing to, you know, let us decide, let us decide when you're ready for what. So there's just a lot of different ways that you can use your experience at AUW to um, prepare you so that you get the best chance there is out there. Um, and the other thing is, once again, to always cherish free and open discussion. Um, it's, can you imagine, I mean, I suppose a lot of you can, where you have all these thoughts in your head and you can never express them to anyone, like maybe not outside of your home, but maybe not even in your home, because you don't trust that your, your brother or your dad, you know, might go bad, right? And they might, you know, start dissing you. <laughs> I don't know. I just the level of fear and the level of intellectual harm that that does, because kids naturally always want to know why, right? They want to find out stuff. And then they want to be able to say what that's on their mind. That's just natural. And so crippling that is really unnatural. But most people who have ever lived have lived with that kind of crippling, especially women. Um, so, you know, I hope you... <clears throat> You know that on the one hand, you worked really hard to earn this place where you're at, but that you really take advantage of it, right? Um, and especially, please do not ever diss another woman. <laughs> please don't hurt each other. Promise me you won't do that. You can diss me all you want if you want to, but don't do it to each other because you're the future leaders, you know? Okay, so let's go with. Each, each student, you know, what the students did in terms of finding your own version of um, your own branch of humanism. What's the view of reason? And we have studied a lot of different views of reason, right? We've studied utilitarian Kant, Augustine, Aquinas, Aristotle, UN, um, and so what's the view of reason? What's the view of either faith or flourishing? What's the relationship? What do you like about the position? What don't you like about the position? What did you learn that you didn't know? Uh, what do you think the position is ignoring? Do you think it's committed to truth? And so these last ones here are related to the mission of Lyon College. We have a mission that says a liberally minded person is committed to truth, is intellectually honest. So, you know, is there a position that claims to know what they don't know? And so they're intellectually dishonest. Is it fair to opposing points of view? Patience with complexity and ambiguity, tolerance of reasoned dissent. So this has been my mission. Uh, it, very consciously when I got to the school I'm at, I've been at for 25 years because the vast majority of students do not get raised to have those character traits. They get raised for blind faith, um, at least three quarters of the students. And they don't have to take philosophy and most of them don't. <laughs> They take religion, they'll take uh, Old Testament, New Testament, something. But my students, right, are the ones that don't want that kind of religion and they come to my class. And so I've had a lot of really wonderful students over the years. Um, but so let me call on people and see, you know, if you didn't get around to it, um, I would like you to do it next time. I do want everyone to present on some branch of humanism. You don't have to answer every single one of those questions, but I do want you to your mind to wrap around those questions as possible ways to analyze any 
position about the human good or a healthy psyche that you run across, right? Is it intellectually honest? Is it fair? Is it based on a, what I think of as a, a good understanding of the human psyche, right? Okay, so Amal, did you come up with anything? Did you bring something? Um, so as uh, I searched like for democratic humanism. Okay. Yeah, so just let me uh, look at the questions so I can, um, okay. Uh, so I think like uh, it is like existed in, like, I want to reflect on like Syria case of democracy and all. Um, I think like my view of uh, reasoning in this uh, field is implicit because like I feel like there is, you know, illusion, as we studied, like the illusion of wisdom and uh, like they claim that we have democracy and they claim that they, they care about uh, humanity. But at the same time, like if you deviated from what they expecting you to think, uh, they will detain you or they will, um, uh, you, you know, like punish you because, yeah, uh, I but I want to say also that um, like this is not true that like uh, what they call democracy in this case it's not true but people like uh, I always think like why people believe in them believe in these political leaders and especially I would like mention like the president for example uh, despite of all the problems despite of all the uh, crisis that uh, that we went through there are still people who believe that uh, you know they they uh, they live in a democratic um, country and they believe that the election, for example, that we had, it was totally based on democracy and tra transparency and all. Um, yeah, that's like what I'm thinking right now. Um, so in Syria, I, they believe that. Yeah, that's what I what I'm surprised <laughs> for. Like we had the election uh, one month ago, and like, come on, we <laughs> it was. A, 10 years of disaster and still it's going on the economy crisis is the thing is they still complain they still complain about the situation but they don't complain about the president because he gave them this uh you know impression that uh yeah we're we're democratic we're offering like you can say what you want but dare to say <laughs> then we will detain your will yeah but yeah i was surprised that people like um are deceived they they still think that th this is democracy and we are living our best life right now um yeah that's okay that's yeah i mean it it absolutely wouldn't occur to me that the syrians thought they had a democracy so i mean it really that's very eye opening to me you know because of course i don't hear that I, but i don't even hear the idea that they get told they have them, right? It wouldn't even cross my mind. It would be that they were told that the leader had to take over because the enemies were so awful. And so, you know, we eventually will have democracy, but we can't have it right now. That would be what I would think they would be saying. So it is interesting that that isn't what they're saying, right? It is interesting to me. Yeah. It's surprising <laughs> to me as well. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Um, Aurora, did you bring a kind of humanism? Uh, no, Professor, not yet. But you can do it next time, okay? Yeah. Sardine? Hello? Uh, can you hear me, Professor? Yep. Uh, yeah, um, so I looked into different kinds of humanism yesterday, and well, they were all very interesting, but I still relate to um, ancient spiritual humanism as defined by Aristotle's uh, virtues the most. I, I think um, ancient spiritual humanism is simple, and um, it's not so vague that one would find it difficult to apply to their own life. 
and it also seems quite universal um, because it appeals to the human nature, uh, or at least my understanding of human nature. Uh, it also allows for unification of reason and faith. Um, I think it is inclusive of people from um, different religions and also people who do not identify with any religion. I think that is very important because um, that gives everyone some common ground. Because you know everyone will never think the same way about everything, um, and I think I, I actually think that diversity of thought is great uh, because I imagine a world where everybody was exactly the same would be uh, very boring, and uh, I don't think human thought would develop very much. Uh, and anyway, it's not possible. Everyone will ever think the same way about everything. I think what's important is that we can um, we find some very uh, the core uh, the basic values that we can all. Um, uh, identify with just because we're human. And I think ancient spiritual humanism allows for that, um, if that makes sense. Okay, so heads up everybody. I had Fardeen last year, so she's totally brainwashed. Um, but you do have to remember another thing that Aristotle was used as a big bludgeon for colonialism because the white guys would say, we have more practical wisdom than you do, right? And so I do interpret it in a different context. And so lots of times a, a position gets judged according to the people who call themselves by that name, right? And then, you know, some of you know that, that Islam is misrepresented by the Taliban, right? But people look at the Taliban, gee, I hate Islam, right? And so people would look at the fact Aristotle is sexist and it was used as a bludgeon. And um, also it was based on a science, which our final reading is going to show that the Aristotle's science was unnecessarily rejected also. But so there were all these reasons. So there were reasons to throw it out, but it threw out the baby with the bathwater. So, um, so try to make sure you don't just judge a book by the cover. You don't just judge Islam by the Taliban, the people who would call themselves Muslims or anything else, right? You don't judge humanism by corrupt people who call themselves humanists and stuff, stuff like that. So the reason to take a philosophy class is to see the substance of it. Otherwise, all you see is the appearance of it, right? Whoever wants to identify with something. Um, so very good. Um, Masoma, have you got something? Did you bring something? Uh, yes, Professor. So I was thinking to synthesize my points that I wrote uh, about the previous comment on the like on the previous on our previous discussion. So yeah, Professor, I want to start it with that. So yeah, uh, firstly, uh, you know, Nochat mentioned about that how Bangladeshi people think that, uh, you know, about studying philosophy. And I think this is a common issue, not only in Bangladesh, but maybe even it was present in ancient, you know, Greece or uh, ancient, I, I don't know, like, uh, yeah, I read uh, the Cultus uh, Republic and it was mentioning that, you know, uh, uh, yeah, there were some people arguing with Aristotle and saying that, you know, and people will not accept you or a, a, a ruler who is philosopher because, you know, they think that philosophers are corrupted or, you know, they are, uh, yeah, they are, um, they, they get corrupted. So I think like this is also a common idea in Afghanistan. I even know a friend of mine who is studying an AUW professor. Like she was, she was taking. Uh, we were taking a similar course, uh, writing seminar, which was philosophy course. And she said that I really like this course. I may, you know, plan to take uh, PPE as my major. But then later I hear that. Uh, she took uh, public health and she told me that, you know, when I shared with my family that I'm deciding to, you know, study philosophy and they were like, no, you cannot do that. Uh, like she was, she was, she, she told me that her mother said that if you study philosophy, do not come back. <laughs> oh, <Again>. yeah. <laughs> well, actually, then that was so offensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, and, my, uh, a lot of my students, in 
at Lyon, their parents, it's the same. So it's not like the U.S. is so far ahead of you. Ahead of you. Go ahead, Masoma. Yeah, and then Professor, I also like agree that religion can be an anti-scientific and you know the example is maybe homophobia toward LGBT community in my country especially or the right of divorce that Emil and Diana was referring to it uh, so you know I was searching on this idea that why people think that you know we should not give the right of divorce for women and then uh, you know guess what what I heard from them they were saying that women are so emotional women are you know uh, sometimes uh, even if we give this right of divorce, then they will, you know, make this decision based on, you know, out of emotion or anger or whatever, but then they, it, it will not be out of rational. Later, they will regret their decision, uh, you know, that's why it's, it's not good to give, you know, this uh, right to the woman but then it is questioning uh you know uh, it means it is an example of the people uh faith that you know women are intellectually inferior to the uh, to men which is not scientifically proved or i mean uh, it's completely irrational right so i think yeah there are this kind of ideas uh, uh or beliefs even uh, related to religion that are anti-scientific uh, i'm agree with that but then uh, I don't agree with this professor that, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, in the Humanism Manifesto 1933, uh, 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 sorry, it was, uh, yeah, 1933, it was mentioned that, you know, every uh, religion should be based on the scientific method. So I think like sometimes it is impossible, like, uh, uh, if you are saying that, if you are believing in that, it means that, you know, there is no God, there is no heaven, uh, because we cannot prove God, right? We cannot prove that there is heaven, but then we have this faith and, uh, you know, it makes sense for us, it, it, it makes, you know, uh, it's rational for us to have this idea because we think this idea is, you know, flourishing, this idea is uh, um, uh, making the life meaningful if you are I mean some philosopher write about uh, divinity and, and the uh, meaningful life uh, right. like Epicros and Epictetus uh, yeah so right. I was thinking about that and then I come up with this idea professor that you know uh, with the um, rational humanism so I think rational humanism must be an uh, idea that is flourishing and honest it's not like you know if something is rational, that should be flourishing. So even if it's not like scientifically uh, proved or or using any scientific method, but then uh, because that idea or that faith or reason, uh, I mean, belief that you have, that is flourishing, that makes you united, uh, that makes you, you know, sympathy toward other people, like you are helping other people and, and, uh, and it gives you a meaningful life. It is flourishing. Uh, yeah, and, and you are honest with it. So I think, yeah, I come up with this idea of that rational humanism would be a best. Uh, yeah, you can of... you can invent your own view, like spiritual humanism. And then, Professor, I am afraid that my idea would be corrupted and misunderstood. It by oh, of course, like, of course. Talk... Yeah. Um, actually, if you think of the arts, right? So music can inspire people to flourish, right? When people get in a certain mood, they'll create music and then they touch other people emotionally. So music helps you flourish. Dance helps you flourish. Stories yes. help you flourish. Poetry, right? And that isn't rational in the science or social science sense, right? But it really yes. does help you flourish. Well, there are people who think that religion is the highest kind of art because it's, it's poetry, it's stories, it's music, it's the arts, it's architecture, and it's all, when you say it's all trying to help people flourish, then you can say, well, yeah, religion just is the highest kind of art, or it's a kind of art. Does that make sense, Masoma? Uh, yes, Professor, that's what I'm saying, like, you know, it should not be, uh, I mean, the idea is not like whether you are monetism or politism or whether you believe on one God or, or whatever, but then the idea is that whatever you believe is this idea is, you know, flourishing or is this idea reasonable uh, for the human uh, mankind. So I think, yeah, uh, 
we are talking about arts and dancing and then there is some limitation and some relation i think like yeah they are not supporting women dancing <laughs> so again uh, the small the liberal arts model is the union of the arts and the sciences in a liberal yeah. to to create a liberal mind and so um that would be wisdom as opposed to just science or social science view of flourishing um so that's a good point um that it, it's not just science or social science it's true and uh it is hard those manifestos sometimes don't point that out or they don't do it enough they just keep having this uncomfortable relationship with religion as if religion is really about science you know as opposed to religion is about art and how art educates the soul, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, uh, Professor, one last comment I want to make, I think it's important, uh, yeah. So I think in uh, 1973 manifest was mentioning about equality, that we should give equal rights to the people and opportunity in that. But then I, I was thinking, you know, it, it very matters when how we define equality. So let's say, um, uh, you know, we should like, we should treat people based on their position. I cannot treat two people equally because I'm saying that they are equal. I should consider their condition talent uh, and situation. So yeah, I think it's important to make it because if you're saying that we should equally treat every people regardless of, you know, considering their talent, their condition, right. their situation, then I think right. it's not fair. Yeah. Right, so yeah, I mean, you should, nobody should um, pay their taxes so that the government can give me the money to go get a PhD in, in math, right? incredible waste of money, <laughs> right? So people are not equal in their talents and they should just have equal opportunity to develop their talents, right? And yes. then I'm not gonna trust um, Masoma if I have COVID, I'm gonna go to a doctor, right? And so I'm not gonna treat people equally when I need a doctor, I'm gonna go to a doctor. Uh, but the yes. thing that's it, true for every professional is they should always use their talent for the well-being of the people who need it, right? Yes. Yeah. That's what the equality is. So I think you're right. You've got to make a lot of distinctions about what that means, right? Thank you. Yeah, that's the kind of thing you write papers about to get it straight in your head. <laughs> um Okay, or you can write your post about that, right? Um, so now, do you have something? Uh, professor, did you call me? Yep. Uh, yeah. Professor, I want to ask, is that there was a military humanism? <laughs> What's it called? No, no, I mean, uh, I, I just want to ask, is that there was a military humanism? Military, military, military humanism? Mm -hmm. Actually, um, there is a, yeah, yeah. Is okay, there, there is a thing called just yeah. war theory. And it's all about how to limit the brutality oh, just... in a war. And I can send you that document. I have like a six page outline of all the okay. criteria for avoiding mm. brutality. Would you like that? Yeah, yeah, Professor. OK, and you can also Google military. I just want to know more, yeah. Yeah, you could Google military humanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can also I just send you more. that. Yeah, I can. Okay, I can. So I like to. Yeah. It, it, yes, yeah. Professor, it's great if you said yeah, I am interested with that. Okay, good, good. Um, all right, uh, Ratika. Professor. Yes, this is Professor. Masoma. Yeah, Masoma. Uh, professor, I was saying that it, it would be better if you share it in the Google uh, Classroom. I am also like interested to read about just war. 
I'm not sure how I can search for it right now, but I'll send it in an email. Is that okay? okay. Yes, I, yes. Yeah. And doing that at the same time I'm trying to do a class is, I guess I'm too old. I can't multitask that much, but um, mm -hmm. I will get it to you. I'll just send it to all of you and that's fine. Um, Tika, have you got something? Uh, yes, Professor. Like. I'm not sure, but when I searched about humanism, secular humanism made more sense to me, like okay. because it emphasizes noble and righteous things of the world rather than that of other worldly tenets of religion. Okay. All right, good. Um, did you read the 2000 manifesto that I had sent? That uh, medicine one? Oh, no, that was the student paper. Did you like the okay. student paper? Yeah, Professor. Okay, good. I'm glad. Um, all right, so you could actually compare what you got when you Googled secular humanism with that attachment that I had, the, two, the year 2000 manifesto, because that is the manifesto of secular humanism. And so... Mm -hmm. If you want to compare them, because obviously humanism has a lot of dimensions and they're open to stuff. Um, but if you wanted to do that, and if you wanted to compare it to the 1933 and 73, it, it is clearly more secular oriented. Um, but anyway, okay, that's great. Because again, I want all of you to know that at AUW, like we, we don't discriminate. Plus, Ritika has a good position, secular humanism. Somebody else has a good position. And, you know, that's, that's part of having a free and open mind is that people are going to, there's going to be a plurality as opposed to a unity. And uh, Aristotle does say that the ideal society is not a unity, it's a plurality. Um, to keep the conversation going, keep you on your toes. You have to, you can't ever lay back and assume you're right. You have to constantly be open and you have to be accountable for what you think because nobody's going to just say, if you, if you get the right label, I'm not going to look inside the package, right? Um, okay, good. Um, Jana Tool, do you have something? I don't know if she's there. Okay. Um, Supti, do you have something? Did you look up something? Yeah, I looked up this uh, secular humanism and military. So I'm deciding which one I'm like to. I'm a bit confused. Okay, it's hard to understand you. Is there some other way you can do your mic? Or uh, starving, I don't know. Um, do you want to type in what you'd like to say or what you looked up? Yeah. Okay, so Supti, you can type in the chat when, I don't know if you, you're disconnected or whatever. Um, New chat, do you have something? Yes, Professor. So um, I, I would like to go for a humanistic philosophy in education system. So I don't know if that's or the, my idea is all right or not but I think education is a tool to make change you can um, make people uh, teach morality equality empathy um, uh, with reasoning only through education so and especially in today's world I think uh, we see education and economics being associated very closely and that is why the change uh, proper change in the system of education is very important you get educated so that you can get good job you can earn money and be successful we associate edu uh, education with uh, earning money too much because we think uh, a richer person is more successful 
so the education system should not teach students to just um, earn money or to uh, or uh, should not te uh, teach students that earning money is on uh, is, is the only way to become successful the uh, the notion of what successful should be changed and it can be changed through education as uh, mr hedges was saying that we have associated education with um, economics too much and that's and I, I think that is a result of falling capitalism now i would say we live in capitalistic uh, society so thinking of but if we think uh, from all sorts of uh, perspective and do cross benefit analysis i think we will see that there's no other choice other than capitalism now uh, thinking of everything so within this structure of society we have to find out possible solutions that are going to benefit mankind the in the most flourishing way so uh, in like in AUW, we are given the values that helps us to realize how to flourish together. Not uh, it doesn't teach us uh, any selfish motive, or it doesn't. Um, I think other people, like uh, uh, with students or with friends with whom I used to study, uh, because they didn't get an environment like AUW, they associate more. Uh, a, uh, they associate education with money more. But after me coming to AUW, I, when I see myself uh, from 10 years from now, I didn't see myself as earning a lot of money, but I see myself as doing, uh, as being someone who will be doing something for a cause. I think that is going to give me happiness, even if not too much money, but it's not going, it's going to give me happiness. So that is the kind of... Um, idea that i got from aw it's it, it maybe if i would if not for aw i would not have thought like this so but our system of education in bangladesh is not like that so okay I, well that's that is what the small liberal arts college was about that you are exposed to the arts music uh that all the teachers in those schools could make more money doing something else but they were in love with this thing that they teach, right? And so students get exposed to all these different passions that people have, these things that they're living for, for the sake of something greater than themselves. So, I mean, that is what AUW wanted to do. Um, it's funny that lots of times people don't say that. And I feel like my course is just sort of hitting you over the head with it, right? Oh, remember that. And then the other thing that just crossed my mind really is because you're being exposed to small liberal arts school, I, you know, I'm hoping some of the EUW students might actually want to go on in education, right? And they might want to try and take that model and spend their lives trying to spread it or at least plant the seed in people's minds about why it's valuable because so so few people in the countries that you come from they haven't even heard of it right they have no idea and um so perhaps you know perhaps uh some of you would feel called to do that but whatever it is you actually do professionally you can always bring that in in your conversations with other people right you just tell them I went to a small liberal arts school and I really grew to appreciate that tradition, right? And in that way, you, you plant the seed for people. Um, does that make sense, Nuchat? Yes, Professor, absolutely. Okay, so Fatima, is she there? I don't think so. Um, Isabel. Are you there? Um, I'll catch you. You know when you're when you're on online. Uh, Rita, are you there? Did you find something? Uh, Asia, whoops. Um, professor, um, I have actually not. I have not nothing to say right now, but I have a question to ask. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. 
uh, so professor we have to answer these questions based on uh, this document and this document is it uh, is it what you say well i had planned on talking about all that stuff i mean your post would be a thousand words long if i if i really made you do all that but um mm -hmm. right so you can i just want you to sort of get a sense of the ideas that were covered in this class um and those are the types of questions i want you to be thinking about um does that make sense yes professor so um okay so we have to like focus on this 2000 uh, manifestos and this one these two articles right i mean sorry these two documents well okay so i think next time i'll probably i might start out with this the 2000 oh, okay. document because it is more anti-religion and so i did want to point that out that i think people know they can tell that um oh i gotta get out of your yeah okay um they they can see the polarization in my country right we're incredibly polarized and and the thing that i don't like is that the humanists are are doing it are partly guilty for it right i think educated people should not polarize right and i think the 2000 document really demonizes religion it calls it archaic and it comes from you know pre-civilization and it's just barbaric and it's just get rid of it right and that just it's not fair and it just create it destroys democracy so that was kind of what i was getting at asia but please you know don't spend 10 hours on it um I, what i just thought is we'll just talk about it in class and i was hoping some of you might notice some of that um does that answer your question yes professor so i have another question so um the questions you mentioned in that document so uh, i mean uh, by which we have to answer i mean by which document I ha we have to answer that those questions oh. Well, actually, that one was the um, the thing that you found. Students find their own, right? Students find their own view of humanism, and then these are the questions. Oh, I see. Okay, it's our yeah. own chart, right? Right. I mean, but but you know, I will talk about how this manifesto, the view of reason and the view of faith and the relationship. You know how that changed over time. So in the 1933, they're really concerned with religious humanism and articulating that. And then in 1973, they're really concerned with articulating non-religious humanism, but they allow religion, right? And then the 2001, it's just like, forget it. And that's not helpful. I, I think it's irresponsible of intellectuals to demonize religion like that. I think it's unfair. It's understandable, it's, but it's not fair. Um, do the rest of you understand kind of? Anyway, I, I hope you look back at that and we can start the next class looking at some of that stuff. Plus, I'll ask uh, the students who hadn't found anything yet to speak if they want a chance. Again, I'm getting to the point where I don't want to force it. I just want everyone to have a voice and to speak, you know, in their voice, uh, to find their voice and speak. But you can't force that. So, um, Marjana, did you have something? Um, not at the moment, Professor. Okay, but I'll, I'll put you down, you know, and I will call on you next time. Um, all right, uh, Diana. Uh, yes, Professor, I will focus on the women's right or based on the women's rule empowerment. 
in Afghanistan situation related to the comments that I mentioned before. Okay, is there a kind of humanism? Really, are there, like, it would be interesting if there's some Afghan woman who's like on social media talking about um, humanism for Afghan women or um, Muslim humanism in Af and Afghanistan, you know, and using Islam to explain why the Taliban is wrong when it comes to women or something like that. Do you think, Diana, you might be able, or I mean, that it's possible that she would get stoned to death or something if there's any such person. Um, uh, professor, based on my opinion, so I don't think there will be basically like this article, but uh, I may find some, uh, some evident sources on social media. Okay, because like I, can... I, I think I've had students in the past they end up talking about some really progressive Afghan women and um, that are fascinating. <laughs> like, but I yeah. wonder how many of them are living in Afghanistan and how many of them got out and then they're, you know, <laughs> I'm not Professor, sure. Professor, on that case, then there is very rare activist women in Afghanistan because if they start their activity inside the Afghanistan, so they will not be anymore. Like in the few last two weeks ago, so they just uh, put their target on the two uh, of the girls who just started to be actress. And one of them had published their, her one of the dramas. So that's why they met her victim and we lost her. So that's why yeah, majority I, of them right. are not living in Afghanistan. Yeah, I also think it's getting worse partly because, yeah. of, my, because of my country. Um, all right, so, okay, so Diana, why don't you try looking for that and I'll call on you next time. Um, Fatima typed something in. She said, I think there's some similarities between Islam and humanism. For example, in Islam, all people are equal regardless of race, color, language. Also that people, whenever they see injustice should stand up, you know, stand against it. The ultimate goal of both Islam and humanism is to make the world a better place. Um, I believe there is a God who created us and wants what's best for us. So I would go for Islamic humanism, right? And it's just that actually you could say exactly the same things for Christianity. You just fill in Christian. Or I think you could say the exact same things for Hindu or Buddhist. It's interesting. See if you could just fill in <laughs> the same, just, you know, exchange the word because they're all, I think those people did not discriminate. Buddha did not, Jesus did not. Um, and, they, and they stood up, stood against injustices. Their goal was always, um, to make the world a better place and they they think there is a god and and god wants what's best for us right so um so that's kind of the punchline there is that you were raised to associate all that with maybe one religion and when you come to college a college you know your roommate says wait a sec I got raised Christian and you could just sort of plug in the word Christian and it's the same, then you can get over that, right? That bigotry or that bias that was just based on childhood. And, um, you know, I mean, when I, when I talk to my kids in um, the US, I say St. Paul, right? Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child. And now that I'm an adult, I've put away childish things. So it's just like how you think about your religion as a child and how you think about your religion as an adult, right? So that's, that's one way to understand the transition. Um, Falak, do you have something? Um, professor, I'll talk about it next time. Next time, okay. Um, I must say when I'm reading Falak's, uh posts i just know okay this woman really thinks for herself like she, i like this i don't like that <laughs> it's great like uh yeah that's how i was i was very opinionated um but 
I think I told you, my father told me when I was in third grade, you're going to have to work out your own theology someday. And he was also my preacher. So, you know, <laughs> so I started getting pretty opinionated, uh, although I didn't express that. It was all in my own head, right? I all did it to myself. Um, I didn't really talk back to people or even really talk that much until about ninth grade. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, I like, I like women who have their own minds and their opinions. And it's just a matter of making sure that you support them. And my job is just, uh, you didn't, you know, you made that claim, but like, you didn't give me the reason why, right? Or I'm not convinced of your reason. So anyway, hang in there, Falak. <laughs> um, who else? Supti, did I call on you? Is there anyone who brought something that I haven't called on? Because if not, I'm going to let you go early because I, this is, you know, later than I, it's 20 minutes, 18 minutes, but I do definitely want you. I know you have 18 minutes. You keep your rear end on the chair and keep your pencil in your hand and finish up that post so that you can move on. And, and I am starting to get posts um, and I will catch up in, in the next four days or so. Um, I, I went to a birthday party and tomorrow my son's family comes back. So I have a few other things to do, but um, anyway, so it's great. It's been great. And I'm glad as many of you can come and the electricity isn't going down. My other class has 17 students and I had five in the class yesterday and it's just hard. Um, so this class seems to have enough mental energy and enough internet energy so we can actually have a conversation. Um, so take care, guys. Bye bye, Professor. Bye, bye. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. You have a good day. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Goodbye, Professor. Have a good day. Good yeah, night. You too. <laughs> bye bye. Bye, Professor. Have a good night. Yep. Bye, Professor. Have a good day. Good day, guys. Whoops. I better turn off the recording. <laughs>